like at this time to introduce the Apollo 13 crew, Captain James Lovell, Mr. John Swikert, Mr. Fred Hayes. Jim? Fine, thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I'd like to start out the uh, briefing by saying that I'm not a superstitious person. And therefore, when we were assigned Apollo 13, I thought nothing of it. As a matter of fact, some of my friends of Italian descent had said that 13 was a very lucky number, and they were happy that I got that number. Uh, it all sort of started uh, actually just before the flight, uh, as was well documented. Uh, as we are approaching the final phase of our training, the last couple days are usually ones of which are taken very leisurely. We try to keep a couple days free just to let ourselves unwind from the long training cycle to get plenty of rest so that when we launch that we're in good shape and, and uh, we can go with a sort of an easy mind. As you well know, uh, a turn of events occurred and Ken Mattingly, who was uh, our command module pilot, uh, was exposed to the measles and at that time we had to make a big decision uh, to bring Jack along or to delay the flight. It was one which was not easy for me to help decide and when they asked me what I wanted to do uh, because we had worked as a team for a long time but I also realized that the, the space program had matured to that degree whereby uh, we had quite a few people who were well knowledgeable about the spacecraft and who were well qualified to fly. As a consequence, uh, on Friday, we, we decided to take Jack along. And I'd like to say right now that I've never regretted that, that decision. Uh, we as a team, I think, and Jack in particular, helped us out during our ensuing uh, odyssey uh, tremendously. Uh, at this time, I think I would like to just break off just a second and introduce uh, a couple other people of our team that, uh, that also served, although we're not as in the same position we were. Marilyn, would you take the stand, please? This is my wife, Marilyn. And uh, right next is uh, my wife, uh, Mary. Now, I think the entire crew of the Continental Stewards are here tonight for Jack. <laughs> Jack had a lot of help on this flight. The launch Saturday morning was not unusual. It was a very nominal launch. The, the suit up, the ingress to the spacecraft was very smooth. We had practiced it before. It seemed even a lot easier than I experienced on Apollo 8. Liftoff came just as I had known it before. Uh, communications were excellent. And the entire boost phase was, has compared, was compared very favorably with what I had experienced before, except during the S2 burn, at uh, which case uh, I noticed the inboard light come on, indicating an S, uh, on the second stage, indicating that an engine had shut down. I had called inboard. Uh, as was the normal procedure, and realized then that it had come about two minutes early. And the ground confirmed this, and as a consequence, we had an early engine out in the S2 stage, and our total boost time was about a minute longer. This did not impair our, our flight, however. We had enough fuel to uh, relight the third stage and go on into a translunar injection and uh, a trajectory towards the moon. The flight up until about 56 hours was, I guess what you'd call it, entirely nominal. We had followed the flight plan. Uh, we uh, were ahead of the game. It took us a little bit longer to get rid of our pressure suits than we thought. And we had asked the ground about 55 hours if we could indeed get into the lunar module about three hours early. The flight plan called to go into the uh, spacecraft at around 58 hours. Uh, the ground said, fine, why don't you uh, open up the limb and go on down and do your housekeeping chores. There was one other little engineering task which we had to perform, uh, and also in 
with that was a television program which we were supposed to put on. So we decided to open up the lunar module. Fred got into the spacecraft, went down, looked at the uh, superhelium, the critical pressure on the superhelium tank to make sure it was nominal. We were having some problems with that before the flight. It was. And then we put on the little TV show, which is called for in the flight plan. I guess the show lasted for about a half an hour. And just after we had turned off the camera, Fred was still in the lunar module. Jack was back in the command module on the left-hand seat. And I was halfway in between in the lower equipment bay wrestling with TV wires and a camera and watching Fred coming on down when all three of us heard a rather large bang, just, just one bang. Now before that, uh, Fred being in the lunar module had actuated a valve which normally gives us that same sound. And since he didn't tell us about it, we all rather jumped up and were sort of worried about it, but it was his joke and <clears throat> we all thought it was a lot of fun at the time since something happened. So when this bang came, we really didn't uh, get concerned right away. But then I looked up at Fred, and Fred had that expression like it wasn't his fault. <laughs> and uh, we suddenly realized that something else occurred, but exactly what we didn't know. I'd like to go on now and let Fred and Jack explain just what their impressions were at this very same instance that I heard the explosion in the lower equipment base. Jack? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the sensation I had uh, that I had felt a vibration accompanying the bang, uh, not a large vibration or shudder. Uh, I proceeded uh, to uh, look at Jim, and and uh, and about the same time, which had, uh, I guess about two seconds had elapsed, when I had a master alarm and uh, a main bus B undervolt light. Uh, I transmitted to Houston that we had a problem and proceeded to over on the right-hand side of the spacecraft to look at the voltage. Uh, the voltage at that time was completely normal. The current was not high, and the fuel cell flows were normal, which indicated to me that whatever it was, it was some sort of a transient that, uh, that didn't exist at that time. Uh, it, uh, me being a command module pilot, uh, and the source of the, the, uh, uh, the bang not immediately determinable, I, it was my thought that, uh, of course, I have a little more confidence in the command module, so I thought it occurred in the limb, and I said, let's get the hatch in here and, uh, and uh, so we can sit back and think about it, because we had the tunnel open at this time, and I was afraid that we might be vulnerable to losing pressure. So I proceeded to get the hatch in. Uh, to begin installing the hatch, and at that time, uh, Fred went back over to the uh, uh, lunar module pilot's couch, and I'll let him tell what uh, his observations were uh, as far as the uh, instruments and the other caution warning alarms. Well, uh, first of all, uh, due to my position, being a, a lot more familiar with the uh, limb side of the house, uh, uh, my natural uh, first impulse on feeling this uh, shutter and uh, an explosion was to uh, make sure the limb hatch 